This is actually a new webinar about career choices or in current situation where there is so much uncertainty. I put together some latest research and put together this webinar to help you guide through the current situation with reference to webinar. This is not specific to any particular role or any function. This is a general purpose applicable webinar per applicable to anyone at the senior level in corporate uh, environment. Now this webinar, as I have announced earlier, that this is in three parts. So we are doing the first part today. And the second part and the third part would be done on the week after same time, same day, Sunday at 8 p.m. Dubai time. So what we are going to cover today, actually, it's a broad picture about, first of all, an update how the how fast the world is changing. Then based on these crises, you call it crises or whatever, there are always challenges and opportunities. And we'll try to scan through what are the opportunities and what are the challenges. Then probably I could help you to narrow down on your career path that based on this current situation, uncertainty and ambiguity, how you should really look and plan your career proactively. And then helping you with some tools to prepare your career path. And maybe you could start, take the first step, which I will suggest you towards the end of this webinar, you can take it today to start your journey. So this is the brief agenda for today's webinar. Next week and the week after, so that would be September 19th and September 26th, same time, it would be Sunday. We'll talk about some advanced topics on the same discussion. So second week, next week, we'll be talking about how to build your reputation. So this is about the, your career tools. How could you use different tools to enhance and boost your career? So your reputation, your personal brand, how to create a supportive network, building a compelling relationship, and also using LinkedIn effectively. LinkedIn is a very powerful platform, and I see that not many people are using it effectively, so we'll talk about that as well. The last session would be more related to the career strategies, and there we'll talk about the planning career planning roadmap, and also very interesting topic about the linear and the nonlinear careers. So that is also changing very fast. Then also targeting a specific position or a role in a company and how to change industries. So we'll talk about some practical tips and tactics and strategy in the last session to help you define your career path going forward. So as you know that the world is changing very fast and there are some major trends which are happening. So I have this slide in front of you, which is basically showing the seven major trends and quickly scan through it if you can. Starting from the upper left side, the technology is making the biggest change, biggest waves right now in every area. So it's not one specific domain or industry. Technology is rapidly advancing and making the lifestyles and the customer behavior very, very rapidly change. The second part is related to the data, tsunami of data. That is also we are experiencing. Now, this is going to make a big change in the business environment as well as the consumer life. Most or almost all businesses, their major problem is to understand the customer behavior. And there is a big promise from the big data because just imagine this, that every one of us typically, from the time we get up, wake up in the morning till we go back to the bed, we are using devices, we are clicking. And all these click clicks somewhere are being captured and those become the data. And this data is basically had the capability through them through, through them sophisticated software and other tools to understand what is our lifestyle. And that is what the businesses are very hungry to understand. So it's not about just making projections about the sales. Businesses soon will have very detailed. In fact, they already have very detailed information about, about our lifestyles. So that would be very significant, significantly change how they sell, how we buy, how they do the marketing campaigns, etc. Then the third item which you see on the left side is more related to the topic we are discussing here, change in nature of a career. So we'll talk more detail about this, what skills are required and how, the, how that domain is changing very fast. Many people are really not prepared for that. 
In the middle, you see it mentions about the diversity and generational change. So millennials are now pretty much in the mainstream. And as we understand, their lifestyle is very different. So that is also creating many challenges as well as opportunities. <clears throat> if you look at the right side on the top, then <clears throat> next trend is about AI, cognitive computing, robotics. It's spreading very fast, especially after the COVID-19, the pace at which the technology is being adopted by the businesses has speed up many fold actually. And technology is becoming cheaper and cheaper every day. So more and more businesses are adopting it. That's again changing significantly the lifestyle and the environment and the structure of the organizations and businesses. Then we have explosion in contingent work. This is also related to the topic we are going to talk about today. That businesses now changing their format or their policies about the recruitment. So they do need employee. But most of the time, they are depending on contingent workers or the temp workers or the contract workers, whatever you call it, because they have learned through several crises that it's very expensive for them to keep the fixed resources or fixed employee force on a fixed arrangement. So that is changing very fast. It also includes the new trend of working from home, which is meant for basically crisis of COVID-19 but it is becoming a permanent norm now going forward. And finally, you see here jobs vulnerable to automation. I think this has been we are talking for several years, but now we started to see the impact in reality about this thing. So keep in mind these seven trends and also the two specific things which I mentioned about the career topic we are going to talk today. This is another slide from Deloitte. And these are very significant trend. Now here they are talking specifically things which are impacting the careers, careers of people like us. So corporate professionals or people in this category. So starting on the uh, left side from the top, 50% of millennials will live to age of 100 and expect 10 to 12 job changes by the age of 38. That's very significant. It's not happening right now. But I think in the next few years, this is going to happen. So life expectancy, as we all know, is increasing rapidly. So with the expect increase in the life expectancy, our career span is also going to increase. Uh, it's a dilemma that on the one hand, we have longer life span. On the other hand, the corporate life tenure is reducing. So what do we do with our life? If you retire at the age of 60, 65, you have for sure another 25, 30 years or maybe 40 years what are we going to do in that happily, as we call it, happily retired life? Not very clear, right? Second item on the top. Half life of technical skills is approximately two years. Now, the term half life is basically uh, used to define the average life of a skill. So, for example, if you learn something today, how long are you going to use it? And they are saying in general, this is reducing also very fast and it is expected to be just two years, just two years, that's scary. For example, very much high in demand today is uh, Python. Everybody wants to learn Python, but question is that how long would it work for you? If it is going to be useless in two years, you maybe have to think twice because then you have to learn at the same time something else very quickly. But that is again, is going to be a very significant reality. Third item on the top, 37% of the work Working people believe they will change career within five years. A lot of volatility, a lot of instability. Next item on the bottom left. Only 20% of companies believe careers in their company are 10 plus years. 44% say less than five years. Again, employers are also accepting the new reality. It's not about lifelong careers anymore. Things are changing so fast. They are they are preparing themselves for the hiring and people leaving or being fired, whatever you call it. But that is going to be very significant activity in the corporate uh, corporate environment going forward. Next item: life expectancy of Fortune 1000 firms is less than 15 years. Less than 15 years. Fortune 500 uh, 1000 companies are supposed to be very strong. They are multi-billion dollar company. And their life expectancy is only 15 years, quite scary. And the last item here is 83% of companies believe 
they will have open careers within three years. Only 19% have a structured career. Structured careers is something like that. When you join a company, you expect spending time long term and develop your career over there. Our companies are saying that we don't expect really offer those type of careers. It would be open careers for them, which means they can join and they can leave and move to other organizations or other professions or careers. So that basically portrays a very concerning picture for all professionals like us. Are we prepared? Of course, we are not. So that's the main motive or objective of this webinar to understand these things in a little bit more detail and see that what are the options available? What can we do? Time is running out fast, but it's not too late. We can still devise our own career strategies and work it out in a prudent manner to prepare ourselves for any contingencies which could happen anytime. OK, so this is an other, another description of how quickly the skills are becoming obsolete. So this is a general measurement that in 1975, an average span of a skill was 15 years. Half-life again. Half-life is ex actually means that uh, the time period by which the skill you have learned is only half used. That is how the term called half-life. So in 1975, this was 15 years. Today, it is just three years. It is going to further reduce. Now, we can't change it. What we can do as an individual professional is to be careful. Where do we want to spend time? So time is really a very scarce resource in these times. And it's not a good idea to jump on everything. Everything comes your way and you would say that I'm a learner. I want to learn it. No, your time is more precious than that. Be very careful how you spend your time. An interesting example, for example, the driving skills. In old times, it was for centuries. Carriage driver, the horse and buggy driving was lasted for a very long time. Then taxis came, automotive came, and that profession also lasted 100 over a year. But look at the current scenario, Uber drivers. It is expected that autonomous cars would soon replace these cars, not only the Uber, but the drivers, the commercial drivers mainly, they would be severely infect, impacted by autonomous cars. It's already there. The companies are already using this technology. So it's only a matter of time. Now, you can say that, thanks God, I'm not a driver. Well, it's just one example. I think this is happening in more or less every profession that certain jobs or professions are becoming obsolete fast. So you need to look what you have been doing, what is your main profession, main streamlined profession, and what is happening and how could you prepare yourself to economically survive going forward. This is another survey. This is also from Deloitte, I guess. Yeah. And here they are saying they made a survey of the employees, professional senior level employees, and asked them, what is most important for you on a job? And it looks like that people will say salary and money, but it's not salary and money. Look here in this survey. The top thing mentioned by millennials is training and development opportunities, which means that millennials are already in the mainstream. And they are the number one priority is training and development opportunities, which means that if you are a little older, you are of my generation, baby boomers or generation X, then you are soon or you are already competing with millennials who are much more passionate to learn faster and deeper. Are we ready for it? This is another chart, interesting chart showing why skills really matter in today's world. So this chart is going long back into the history, but what it is showing is the goods producing jobs, manufacturing jobs, and the service jobs. And look at the trend. I think in every economy, whether it's a developed economy or a developing economy, this trend can be seen very clearly that there are more and more service jobs than manufacturing jobs. And service jobs require a skill set. You need to learn a lot to deliver services. 
So pay attention here. This is a typical description of a carrier. So look at the upper side of the slide. This is called a linear career that you expect you complete your education, you start somewhere, you become a junior employee, then you make progress and ultimately you reach to the highest level which you were expecting. This is called a linear career. Unfortunately, it is not happening much. I think many of you sitting on this call have seen that it's not working anymore. There are, there are few lucky people or a uh, few people who have uh, who could have experienced this, but majority is really having different experience. Now, what you see at the bottom of the slide is called non-linear career. Non-linear career means that you started same way, like completing your education, you started somewhere, and then you got fired or you were laid off, or you some for some reason you were jobless. Then you restarted your career, learned something else. Again, it started a career expecting that you will make progress, but something happened and you have to go back to school and learn something else and again restart your career again. And that is how ultimately you became a diff you ended up having a different profession or a different career or maybe you started your own business. You become an entrepreneur that is happening more and more. I think it also happened with me partially that I left my corporate uh, role at some point of time and started my own uh, venture, which I'm still busy right now. So. Again, the idea here is not to scare you. Idea here is that we need to accept these as realities. These are not accidentals anymore. You can easily anticipate these things happen, which means if you could easily anticipate, you need to prepare for it. So reality is that we are in a VUCA world. And those of you who are not familiar with this VUCA term, VUCA stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, ambiguity. And this is not temporary. This is not short term. This is the new reality which is going to last. So if this is the new reality, we need to do something about it, right? And it's very fast, rapid change. I read somewhere that until the end of 19th century, the lifestyle of a father and son were very similar because there was not much change. Today in one line is life span. Look back at your life. How many changes you have seen? Some people say that in the last five years we have seen changes equivalent to 500 years in the history. Or maybe more. But fact is that now we are facing changes in a very rapid fashion. So we have to gear up to deal with those changes. So why are we really worried about our career? I mean, becoming an em employed or becoming an employee was used to be considered a safe option than starting a business. Once you get an employment, it was considered secured, less worry, you have a regular stable income, no more, right? So even if you are employed, you could be an employee, but you are more like an entrepreneur and you are in the business of selling your talent. There is no guarantee of continuation or stability of job. Every day you have to prove your talent to make your earning. So that is what we are looking from the point of view of this reality that how could we gear up? How could we prepare ourselves to face these critical situation ahead of us? And all this is going to lead to one harsh reality. There are more people looking for jobs than the jobs available. That's very clear. There is no doubt. And it's not going to change again. It's not temporary. That it's going, people will say that it would get better. This is going to get worse, actually. If you could recall the future of job reports by World Economic Forum last year, what their predictions or projections are, they're all going in one direction only. There would be more people seeking for employment than the opportunities available. So it is going to be more comparative, whether you like it or not, it has to be more comparative, which means that in order to find your job, you have to be better than others. That's a harsh reality. So let's 
try to understand one by one different aspect of this issue we are talking about. So one common threat across all the industries, all the profession, all the jobs is the automation. That now I think it's becoming a lot more clearer that what is at risk and what is not. But the general concern is that whether robots will take my job or not. So let's try to understand what robots or machines or computer offer. Automation offers only three skills very clearly. Speed, accuracy, and memory. And it's very clear we cannot compete with automation with reports on these three skills, the speed, accuracy, memory. We cannot compete with them. Let's accept it, which means all the jobs which require speed, accuracy and memory are being taken over by reports or automation. And they are doing a much better job. All the mechanization or automation in different industries is mainly built on speed, accuracy and memory. So what we could do as humans, look at the human's capability or unique skills. So we have unique skills in the area of higher cognitive skills and social and emotional skills. Now, computers are making progress here, but I think still they are not very close where what human could offer, especially related to the social and emotional skills, emotional intelligence. I'm not sure if we could see a robot with having the same level of emotional intelligence in our lifetime. So for some people, this is crisis. This is challenge. For many people, this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity to upgrade yourself. If you are involved in a job which requires speed, accuracy, and memory, promote yourself. Try to do something more valuable, which is related to higher cognitive skills and social and emotional skills. So I know that everybody is not prepared. They were very comfortable in the speed, accuracy, memory jobs, but again, accept the reality. It's no more there. If you want to survive, you want to make progress, you need to learn something. So learning has become inevitable for everyone. Lifelong learning, actually. And this is another chart showing shifting priorities in terms of skills. So building upon the same argument that we could offer as humans, we could offer a lot more value. Look what skills are at the top. So in this chart, critical thinking and analysis is on the top in terms of increasing growing demand, problem solving, self-management, working with people, management and communication of activities, and so on. And at the bottom, you see there are skills which are related to technology use, core literacies, and physical abilities, which are actually declining. So I think every one of us understand what is happening and where the demand is coming or going through going towards what i see as a main challenge for many people is to understand how they could develop these skills so there is a trap when you look at the skills like critical thinking analysis problem solving self-management working with people many people will say i can do it or i already do it there is really not much for me to learn anymore that's a trap now these terms look or sound very familiar but what they are talking about is a very deep level of understanding and expertise in these areas. So just keep that point in mind and further expand on it, that it's not that simple that you look at this term, which looks familiar. And you can see this, you can feel that I already know it. It's not that easy. This is another slide from the future of job reports from World Economic Forum last year. And that report, I think that was the third report in a series starting with 2016 or 17, then 18, then 2020. And with high level of consistency, they have repeated the same trends. If you look at this list, it starts on the top analytical thinking and innovation, active learning, complex problem solving, critical thinking and analysis, creativity, originality, leadership, social influence, and then comes the technology. Now, let's observe something very important here. We talked about the life cycle of skills or the average life of a skill, how long would it take? And experts are saying it's somewhere between two years to five years. If you look at these 10 skills here, which are similar in, in a group, but quite different. So there is a top group like soft skills, 
And at the bottom, there are some technical skills. I think everybody could understand that technical skills have a short tenure. If you learn Python language today, it would be very valuable. But how long it would be valuable and marketable, we don't know. It could be useless in two years, or it could still be working for five years. But there would be a there would be something else would be working in place of Python. That's very clear when it comes to the technology and hard skills. A lot of development is going on. But when it comes to the human skills, like social skills or the cognitive skills, for example, complex problem solving is not going to be replaced by something else that would remain there for a long period of time. Creativity, originality would remain there as a skill. Leadership would remain there for a long period of time. So we are not saying that there are skills which could replace these cognitive and social skills soon. Or there are not much probability that human skills would be replaced by something else in this category. So if you have a choice to learn some technical skills versus the non-technical skills, which will, would you do? Of course, based on your job and profession, you have to learn some technical skills. But don't forget, there is a huge value of those schools, skills which are going to last longer or your ROI on your learning skills, learning effort would be very, very high for these skills. So look at this slide closely. You may find yourself in three zones or three categories here. First is the comfort zone. Then we have a learning zone, panic zone. This is related to the learning status. Comfort zone is for the people who think that they already know enough and there is no urgency. There is no need to really learn any further. So they are in their comfort zone. Unfortunately, that is the majority of the people. Almost 70, 80 percent people in the comfort zone, not realizing that things are changing. Then in the learning zone is the people who are basically realizing that this is the time to learn and they are busy learning. And the panic zone is for those people who were not prepared, who were in the comfort zone, and suddenly there was a situation, they realized that they don't know what they don't know, and they're in the panic zone. But I hope that you are in the learning zone because you are sitting in this webinar on a voluntarily basis, right? You're in a learning zone. But those people who are in the comfort zone, they don't know where they are heading to until they find themselves in the panic zone, which means that if you don't, Proactively plan to be in the learning zone, you may end up finding yourself in the panic zone if something goes wrong. And then there would not be much time available to start your learning journey. Okay, this chart is also very interesting and informative. So, what is going to happen in the corporate world? This is related to the resources or employ employment. When you look at this chart, you will see different layers of the people who are supporting the organization. And the first layer is the core on-site employees, course on-site employees. Then you have remote employees. Then you have freelancers and gig workers. Then you have consultant. Then you have contingent workers. Then you have external resources. So which means that if today, an organization have a lot of core on-site workers, they are not going to have the same number soon. They would have fewer employees, but more talented employees retained by the company. And highly paid by the way. So you can understand that if they are only going to retain highly paid core employees, those employees have to be highly talented as well. It's not about an average employee, average worker, that if they have to make choices, who is contingent, who is core employee full time on the site, they would like to keep people who are highly talented and they are willing to pay high salaries and high payments, high wages for those people. Now, where do you want to be? You can have a choice. You can say, I'm happy to be a contingent worker or contract worker or happy to be where I am. But if you want to really an ambitious career oriented person, you would like to be in the core category. The first core on site employees, highly talented, highly paid. Which means that you have to do your job, your part. 
first learning their skills, getting talented, and then hopefully you'll find your place into that category. So those people who really struggle understanding that what are these skills we are talking about and where they apply, look at this slide. I think this is also from Deloitte. So we are talking about curiosity as a skill, imagination as a skill, intuition as a skill, creativity, empathy, emotional intelligence. Where these activities, uh, skills are applied, look in the within this circle, some activities. For example, identifying unseen problems and opportunities. Developing solutions to address problems and opportunities. Implementing solutions. Iterating and learning the activities of redefined work. So this is related to that core segment of employees who are highly talented, retained by the company and highly paid. That is their job. Their job is not related to speed, accuracy and memory. Their job is not well defined, actually. But having these skills like curiosity, intuition, creativity, empathy, problem solving, they have the ability to find out the problems and solve them for the company. This is what they are looking for, employers. Are you in that category or can you be in that category? It's not well defined, as I said. Or if you still not really clear about what is what is being required by employers, look at these three or uh, four categories, creativity, collaboration, communication, critical thinking. Do you have these skills? And again, not at the surface level, but the deeper level. So one crucial question in front of us, every one of us is that if, if this is the situation related to the nature of skills, and demands on us to learn what skills you need to learn. Now, again, generalize into broad categories. I think uh, there was uh, has been a question always that do I want to become a generalist or do I want to become a specialist? If I relate it with the profession, you can say that do you want to be a treasurer or a tax expert that's a specialist or do you want to be a senior level vice president finance that's more like generalist? So if you look at the life cycle of a skill, as we just discussed, that if there's a very limited time span of learning skills, it would be more prudent for us to learn the skills which have a longer life, which are general in nature. So skills which are globally applicable, which have a longer life, which are transferable, should be the skills we need to spend more time now. Based on your job and profession, you still need to learn some specific skills. But as I said, we are generalizing. When we generalize, it looks like that the generalist path is more common. But again, you don't have to really pick one or two between the specialist and generalist. There is a third category which is emerging is versatilist. Versatilist is a specialist as well as a generalist. And look at the few bullets on the right side. What does it tell? So a specialist, deep skills, narrow scope, we are recognized unknown outside domain. This is the tax expert or merger and acquisition expert in an organization. Generalist is broad scope, shallow skills, quick response, and other, others lack confidence in this area. So this could be, as I said, vice president finance or even a CFO could be a generalist. Versatilist is deep skills, wide scope of roles, broad experience, recognized in other domains as well. That is the ideal path going forward. And based on that idea or philosophy, what I find, let me just show you next related slide. Yes, so who is versatilist? Versatilist is a professional who has multiple deep skills. He or she can fulfill the various roles. They have a broad experience and they are also recognized in other domains. And the most common category which falls into this area is 
C level. That's the title of this webinar. C suit executive. Now I'm hoping that everybody is familiar with the C suit executive. But generally in the organization, you see CMOs, CEO, COO, CTO, CFO, CRO. These are all the chief officers of something. Chief executive officer, chief financial officer, chief information officer, chief technology officer, chief of, uh, marketing officer, etc., etc. Now, realize one thing that CEO is definitely a very broad description. But other areas like CFO, CTO, CMO, it feels that they are very specialized roles, actually. So CFO is supposed to be a financial expert only, or CMO is supposed to be a marketing expert, or CTO is supposed to be a technology expert. It is not like that, actually. I know many CFOs who are not trained in accounting, who do not have an accounting background. I know several CTOs and CIOs who do not have a technical background. So why they are CFOs and CTOs? Because that is not the requirement of the job. The requirement of the job is, let me show you the other slide. So what is not required? Why C suit role? So Relate it with the generalist and specialist roles we just talked about, right? And think of a versatilist somewhere in between. And then think of the C suit role. What is the typical C suit role? Is applicable to CFO, CTO, CMO, CEOs, every C level role. What is not required, so this is contrary to the general belief and general understanding that a CTO is supposed to be a highly expert in technology or CFO has to be highly specialized in finance. It's not required. It's nice to have, but no technical knowledge or expertise required for these roles. Number one, no professional certification or higher academic degree required for this role. You do not need to be an extraordinary functional expert in this area and no specific experience is required in this role. Now, these are nice to have. Most people have it. But what I'm trying to explain here, it's not required. What is required, however, is a reasonable level of functional expertise. If you are CFO, you have to have a reasonably good idea what finance function is. Same applies for marketing and technology and logistics supply chain, etc. What is required? Very crucial, outstanding leadership skills. What is required? Extraordinarily high level of emotional intelligence. What is very important? A deep insight is business strategy, understanding the overall business model and excellent communication skills. This is required on the right side. The bullets, these are required. If you don't have one of one or a few of those, it would be difficult for you to survive in that role. What you see on the left is nice to have. If you have good, that would be extra advantage, but it is not required. If that is the case, see yourself. Look back at your background. Look at your career. Look at your talent and see, can you fill one of these roles? And also including CFOs, by the way. So most of the people sitting here, I assume you are finance professionals and your goal is to really land into a CFO role. But CFO role does not require those things on the left side. What is required on the right side? So I often see people coming to me and asking that who are basically struggling in their career, asking that I'm an ACCA, should I do CMA also? because they think that by adding those qualification and certification, it will help them their career. No, absolutely not. It's a waste of time. What you need to spend, if you want to spend time and money and resources, then spend on the leadership learning skills, learn, learning a strategy about the business. Those things will make the difference. Practice a lot about your communication skills. Those things will really make a difference for you. If you believe that, it's a lot more easier because all those things, even if you don't have today, is doable. Learning a strategy or learning leadership or practicing communication skill is not rocket science. You can do it easily. That is where this versatilist role comes. So once you are in this category, you have basically a versatile set of skills with you. You can do multiple roles. Now, this is also very important 
in the scenario where we are not sure about the future. In the future of job reports, I think with consistency, they have said that it's very difficult even for experts to predict on project what roles would survive, what role would not survive. So they are not much talking about the roles and jobs anymore. What they are talking about is the skills because they are very clear that what skills would be required on future, but they're not sure what roles those skills would be applied to. Same goes for CFO role. When I have spent my life as a CFO and I have some expertise, I could tell you five years from now, would there be a CFO role? I don't know. But there would be someone else using those skills which are required by a CFO. So in this situation, is it not smart to focus on the skills rather than roles and also try to develop those skills which are more universal, which are more global, which are more transferable. So if you don't become CFO, you become someone else at the same level. Or you change industries. Or you change occupation. So leadership, strategy, communication. These are all very broad skills, but very valuable. And they have a long life cycle. They're not going to be obsolete, obsolete in our lifetime. I can, I can see that clearly. Why not spend our time and money into developing these skills? Again, I'm not suggesting that you don't do those technical skills. If it is required, you will do. But broadly speaking, your focus should be these soft skills, not really trying to do another CMA in addition to your ACC or chart accountancy. So this is another dilemma or trap for many professionals. I think everybody in this sitting in this webinar would agree that getting a C role is not easy, right? Wherever you are, even if you are one or two steps away, it requires a lot of effort. It requires actually transformation, right? So this is the journey of transformation. If you want to learn something, or you want to change yourself, you want to build your career, you start with something like creating awareness, then understanding, then acceptance, value shift, belief, application, transfer. Transformation is the very high level. Now, typically what happens, if you want to learn something new, you will enroll for a training online or offline, whatever. And you would go in the training and you would listen to the lecture, or you would read a book or you watch a movie, right? And you develop some understanding and awareness. That's the first two levels. And then you will see that, okay, I have learned enough. What you have learned is nothing because if you don't follow up further in two to four weeks, you are back to where you started. That happens with most of the typical traditional trainings you go to a five day training, full day, full five days training. You spend a lot of time. You enjoy it. You learn a lot. But then you come back with a lot of information. Don't do anything. Put all the information on the shelf. And in three to four weeks, you are back to square one where you started. Right. Now to reach, make progress on this scale, which you are looking at your screen, you need to do something practically, which means that, OK, first step is de definitely developing knowledge but then you to need to practice it. That is where people struggle. You need to practice, you need to interact with other people and you ultimately you reach to a level of acceptance, value shift, your belief changes, you are doing it every day and then you get into the transformation mode. Let me elaborate that point a little further because this is very important. So most of the people in profession are in the process of knowledge building. Now, this is important. We did, we actually spend first half of our life building our knowledge, right? School, college, university, we were building knowledge to prepare our career. That was one phase. That was the major part of knowledge building. Then you started your career. And in your career, you were supposed to use that knowledge, knowledge execution. The so knowledge build up, first phase of life, knowledge execution, second phase of life. How do you execute the knowledge? It's very different to execute the knowledge. You need to work with people. And unfortunately, we are not trained to work with the people. We are not taught communication. We are not taught emotional intelligence. Many people struggle. Some lucky ones who have the naturally gifted, they survive, they succeed. But many people struggle because they are not trained into it. Now, on top of it, what happens that when we are in the second phase, we think 
we all is all about knowledge building so we try to further build the knowledge going again and again on training let me go back to this slide so in the second phase of life we are again trying to build knowledge so we are going to trainings we are doing some certifications and building the knowledge and still not executing it that's a big mistake that is why you see a lot of many people who have long abbreviations next to their name all abc alphabet actually and they are sitting on a junior junior position because they misunderstood it's not about getting certification and degrees only you need to apply practically how do you apply practically so let me show you one more graph this chart is from harvard university so pretty reliable and it's very simple and straightforward there are two lines crossing each other one line is the your ability to learn your response to experiences what whatever you do every day what you learn and this declines with the age age very clearly so you see is starting is scale is starting with the age of 2 4 6 8 10 very young very high level of learning capability as you progress in your age this ability declines and i think by close to age of 30 it's breaking even breaking even with what the other line is the amount of effort required to change again young age you have very high capability to change yourself you go to school every day and you learn a lot you change a lot but as you get matured life in the middle of your career it becomes a struggle you are learning but your ability also declining so by 30 years of age you are at the break even of your learning capability and learning effort then why are we sitting here does it mean that we cannot learn afterwards absolutely not but what you need to do you need to change your efforts make more efforts to learn you learn all of your life in the beginning phase by just going to school and listening to the lectures in real life after first phase you need to practice it you don't learn by listening to lectures that is what happens with five days training when you go there and you just listen to the lecture and you come back in two weeks four weeks it's all gone that doesn't work so you need to practice which means you need to make need to make efforts when you go to a specialized training program or make some special efforts sitting with a peer group and do something different then there are chances of learning so it also relates to the iq eq we all have iq iq could be measured and we use iq in our first phase of life when you when you do your studies and education in the first phase all you need is your iq but in the second phase to work with the people we need eq and again we are not trained in eq that is why many people many professionals are employed because of their higher iq and then they are fired because of their lower eq we need to work on our eq as well okay this also relates to left brain right brain i, I think scientists tell us that when we are born our left brain is weak the logical brain but we are our right brain is very active and very smart and all the creativity and learning abilities are reside in the right brain so we lose our ability as we grow in age that is how as a matured adult you question everything even for yourself you want to do something but then your inner voice which is the left brain is questioning something you want to test everything through a logic through a rational before you do anything look at your kids young children they don't question those things they don't apply logic every time they are just going naturally that becomes our limitation so this chart shows you the ability of the left brain and right brain so what you see on the left side the orange triangle think of this as a left brain logical brain it is starts to develop with the age and right side look at the green triangle this is your right brain which is more creative so you start your life with the big right brain and with the progress as you make in the age your right brain is shrinking or reducing in its capability and logical brain so by the time you reach to adult you have lot of wisdom and rational and logic not much creativity and innovation okay so what we could do about it this is another chart showing there is a decline in our ability to learn with the age but you could you could make it intact or further improve it so there are two lines basically 
going parallel and the lower line is the natural decline and the other line is basically performance improvement so when you do extraordinary things you are able to upgrade that ability to bring it at a higher level by bringing some extra efforts I'll pass this slide for the sake of time. Okay, so this chart is also very important to just understand. In our daily performance, in any area like corporate environment or work or family or personal life, usually we are able to observe our performance and other people's performance at the surface level. Surface level, we see communication, performance, attitude, behavior, personality. And we try to change it at the surface for other people if there are people working for us or for ourselves, we try to change it at the surface. But look below the surface. Why are we behaving the way we are behaving is because of other things at the bottom. So our beliefs, our adaptability, our knowledge, our creativity, empathy, our cultural awareness, our personal values, all these things basically drive our behavior. So if you want to change your behavior, you need to work on these driver first. This is a summary of all the skills which have been mentioned as a top skill for 2022 or 2025. So I try to identify and pick top 10 most important skills. And what you see in this pyramid are basically a sequential listing of these skills, starting with some foundational skills like emotional intelligence, creativity, th creative thinking, innovation, and then enhancing skills like cultural awareness, adaptability, cognitive flexibility, and then external, the interactive skills we use with other people is storytelling, negotiation, collaboration, service orientation. These are the top 10 skills you need to look at for your future roles, to develop yourself for the future roles. The three skills which you see on the side as survival skills, everybody has those skills already at some level. You do have a personal brand, whether you know it or not. You do have some level of relationship and you do have some level of communication, right? These are the skills we have from the very beginning. Now, the dilemma here is that in order to develop these skills, which are in the pyramid, which are the most critical ones for the corporate leadership success, requires the application of these survival skills as well. Communication is the most important skills. Communication is the tool or the window through which you interact with the world. So you cannot really learn emotional intelligence by reading books. You cannot develop negotiation skills or storytelling skills by watching movies. You need to practice it and the only way to practice these skills is interacting with other people. So forget about everything else. Just start with your communication skills, practicing communication skills. That's the key. And unfortunately, most people don't think that they need to start with communication skills or even they want to learn communication skills. People ask me if I could, could I recommend some books on communication? I said, there are no books on communication skills. You need to practice it. Just jump into the water. You cannot learn swimming by watching 100 videos, tutorials on swimming or reading books. You need to jump into the water. That's communication. Communication is your starting skill. And And that's what could be easier than communication. And don't think that you don't, you have some lack of communication skills. We all have communication communication skills. If you doubt, just think how fluently or how comfortably you talk to your family and close friends. That's the communication. The only thing is that when we bring that communication to the formal environment like work, we become a little reserved. We lose our confidence. So it's not a communication issue. It's a confidence issue. And the only way to overcome your confidence is practice, practice, practice. Let me give you a practical idea. So what we did last year at the Mecca CFO Academy, we have a lot of programs, but we wanted to really promote this communication things as much as possible. So Toastmaster, there is no other organization better than Toastmaster to really start practicing your communication skills. So we said, okay, we don't need to reinvent wheel. What we could do is from the Mecca platform is sponsor that program with the Toastmaster. So we look at the Toastmaster. And by the way, Toastmaster, some of you already practice, is very cheap, uh, unbelievable the price they charge. 
uh, it's only $45 for six months. And there is a $20 first time, one time entry fee. So we try to create a pool of clubs at the Mecca platform. So these are not like any other Toastmaster club that you could go and join and don't know who are the other people. This is a very exclusive club with Mecca sponsored members, which means that if you join a Mecca Toastmaster club, you could ensure that there are CFOs, there are controllers, there are senior level corporate professionals, right? So we created a platform. We enrolled people from Mecca community into those, and then we work with Toastmaster and registered and created four clubs. So there are four clubs operating for one year. They are in Saudi Arab, they are in Middle East, they are in global uh, Western part, and some are in the India and Pakistan, right? What we are doing for this, if you are interested, if you are not, not first of all, if you don't know Toastmaster, do some research. It's a well-known organization. This actually provides a platform where you could go, go now and then every other week and practice your communication skills in presence of other senior people. We have been running this club for two years. What we did from Mecca platform, we did not charge anything. There is no fee you have to pay to the Mecca at all. But we coordinated. So Toastmaster club fee is $45 for six months and $20 new membership fee. We collect this fee, but just paid back to the Toastmaster. If you want to join these clubs, there is no fee you are paying. In fact, you get more advantage because, it's a, as I said, it's an exclusive membership club. So you get interaction with a huge network we have. You get very sophisticated peers and participants to practice with you and give you feedback. And then we coordinate the whole structure with the Toastmaster. Toastmaster has a lot of support from their organization. So right now, there are more than 100 people part of this Mecca membership club. I invite you uh, to start your skill development journey. What we have talked about is start with this one small step. As I said, you're not paying anything to me or to Mecca. You are paying this money to Toastmaster, which is peanuts, actually. If you look at your career and you look what journey you have to do, $45, uh, six months and $20 one time is nothing. I'm surprised how could they really survive with this fee. So I'm giving you a link on your computer now. So I've sent you this link. If you don't find this link, you can just go to the Mecca CFO website and search in the, the programs. There is one club, Toastmaster club for new members and you can enroll it.